Hey everyone, we're back with more of this series exposing all the frauds at Discovery Institute, the Christian propaganda mill whose sole purpose is to lie about science for Jesus. We've gone through a lot of the main figures already, but there are a few more to get through, so let's continue by exposing Jonathan Wells. Wells got a PhD in religious studies in 1986 and another in cellular and molecular biology in 1994, and he is one of the very few DI members that is listed as an author on a handful of legitimate scientific publications. But like any other such apologist, this only serves to provide a veneer of credibility and bolster his anti-science rhetoric. His bizarre religious beliefs are derived from the cult-like Unification Church of Korea, which he describes in this blog post. In another similar post, he openly admits that after his religious studies, he only entered the field of biology because he thinks God spoke to him and told him to devote his life to destroying Darwinism. And of course, by Darwinism, he actually means the modern scientific consensus on biological evolution, which represents the obvious refutation of biblical creationism that he clearly believes in. So he entered a PhD program and prepared himself for battle like a complete lunatic, after which he joined Discovery Institute. Of course, decades later, the DI presents him as a rational thinker and a scholar, even though the fact that he entered science with the explicit goal of discrediting it renders everything he says completely irrelevant. Just like his fellow frauds, Wells has written a few books on intelligent design, most notably his 2000 book, Icons of Evolution, which was full of lies, misquotes, and deliberate distortions of science. This pile of garbage was scathingly reviewed by Alan D. Gishlick at the National Center for Science Education. Linked below, this review takes over 50 pages to demolish every ridiculous thing Wells says, but to give you a taste, one of the subchapters is called Peppered Moths Don't Rest on Tree Trunks. Of course, he is trying to refute the very obvious example of evolution by natural selection involving peppered moths changing color over time due to the survival advantage of better blending in with trees, simply by claiming that moths don't even rest on tree trunks. Notably, population geneticist Michael Majerus blew this argument out of the water in his own original book on the subject, where he found that 35% of the peppered moths did indeed rest on tree trunks, and his posthumously published restudy of the issue continued to confirm that. So with Wells, it's clearly empirical science versus nuh-uh, as always. Now that you have an idea of the brilliance Wells is bringing to the table, let's see what he's been up to more recently. First, let's look at zombie science. John Jonathan Wells on overselling Darwin's Tree of Life. The scientific establishment typically portrays the Tree of Life as a fact, uh, something we can't question. All things are, all living things are related through common ancestry. But even in 2000, there were empirical problems with this claim. And now, 17 years later, the problems have grown worse. Uh, for example, in 2000, it was hoped that by comparing molecules, DNA, proteins, and so on, uh, we could construct a tree of life that would sort of zero in on the true tree. There can only be one true tree, if in fact there is one at all. Uh, and yet the more molecules that have been studied, uh, the more inconsistencies have turned up in the tree of life. So the molecules don't fit each other in many cases. They don't fit the anatomies. Uh, you get different trees depending on what you look at. Plenty to unpack already. The tree of life is a conclusion based on what is now over a century of data from morphology, ontogeny, paleontology, and more recently, genetics. To pretend otherwise is just pure science denial. Wells states right before this section that we can group organisms into a nested hierarchy based on their morphological traits. All birds have feathers. Birds and mammals both have vertebrae, making them part of the larger clade vertebrata. All vertebrates are multicellular and phagotrophic, making them part of the even larger clade animalia, and so forth. This is a nested hierarchy where organisms are grouped into categories within categories. Carlos Linnaeus recognized this when he developed our modern taxonomic scheme in the 1700s, but he had no explanation for why this pattern existed. Darwin provided the mechanism for this pattern with biological evolution. The elegance and consistency of the explanation with all the data collected since Darwin is irrefutable. So what does he do? 
He lies. Like all creationists, he just invents the notion out of thin air that there are empirical problems with the tree of life. Let's go over one example that demolishes this lie. A 1992 experiment by David Hillis et al. demonstrates that methods of inferring phylogenies accurately uncover actual organismal histories. They did this by making a known phylogeny using T7 bacteriophages. From a common stock, the bacteriophage populations were propagated and divided in such a way that they ended up with nine different taxa with known phylogenetic relationships. They also propagated these bacteriophages in the presence of a mutagen, which was done to increase the mutation rate, resulting in greater genetic differences between the nine taxa. Regarding the data used to infer the phylogeny, they made use of endonucleases. These are enzymes that recognize specific sequences of DNA called restriction sites. When these are present, the endonuclease cleaves the DNA within or nearby the restriction sites. The presence of restriction can be determined using gel electrophoresis, a technique we described in the biology series. Samples of DNA which were cut by endonucleases are forced through a gel using an electrical charge. Smaller fragments of DNA are able to move faster than larger fragments. So based on the number and positions of the DNA bands observed on the gel, the presence and absence of restriction sites can be inferred. As to why this is relevant, remember that restriction sites have a specific DNA sequence. Restriction sites can be gained or lost due to mutations, so the presence and absence of these restrictions can be used to infer phylogenetic histories. And that's exactly what they did. Next, they used five different methods of phylogenetic inference to infer the phylogeny of the nine taxa based on the restriction site data. All five methods were able to accurately predict the correct phylogeny. Nine taxa may seem like a small number, but for just nine taxa, there are 135,135 possible trees. Guessing the correct tree by chance is extremely unlikely, yet they did it five times with different methods. This is precisely the type of empiricism that creationists refuse to even acknowledge because they have no ability to account for these results and no ability to substantiate their baseless beliefs in this kind of a rigorously quantifiable way. That's because it's the difference between science and religion. To get more specific, what Wells means by inconsistencies is that not every gene is going to return the same phylogeny. This is extremely well known in biology, and the reasoning for it is very simple. For one thing, separate populations, sometimes even those of different species, can interbreed and share genes. This is called introgression. Imagine a population of polar bears. One day, a polar bear breeds with a brown bear, and some alleles from the brown bear parent end up in the offspring. From there, some of those brown bear alleles eventually reach fixation in the polar bear population. In other words, the alleles spread through the population until every polar bear has them. Now, if a geneticist comes along and sequences the genome from some random polar bear individual, the geneticist will find that the vast majority of their alleles will be of polar bear descent, but not all of them. Logically, then, we can infer that those foreign alleles were introduced to the population via introgression from another population. So there is nothing inconsistent here at all. Introgression among eukaryotic organisms tends to really only happen for populations within a species or closely related species, so this is much less of a discrepancy than Wells is trying to make it out. As for prokaryotic organisms, horizontal gene transfer among distantly related lineages is much more common, allowing genetic exchange outside of the context of reproduction, and thus something that one might call an inconsistency with phylogeny. But again, this is is a completely natural and well-documented process. While HGT can sometimes make prokaryotic phylogenies more difficult to resolve, prokaryotes still exhibit a nested hierarchical distribution just like eukaryotes. This isn't so much of a problem for evolution as it is simply nuance in the process that creationists like Wells either don't understand or lie about to deceive the public. In this particular instance, it is most likely the latter because Wells resorts to speaking complete gibberish. He says that the molecules don't fit each other and don't fit the anatomies. 
This is literally meaningless. The genetic data that all mammals are more closely related to each other than they are to any other organisms is incontrovertible. Then the characteristics that unite all mammals, those being mammaries, hair or fur, and three inner ear bones, are found only in mammals. So we have anatomy corresponding perfectly with molecules, no matter what molecules he could possibly be talking about, proteins, nucleic acids, or otherwise. Birds are all more closely related to each other genetically than to any other group, and have a unique set of morphological characteristics. So do amphibians. So do sharks. When you compare the anatomy and genes of these organisms, you find that mammals and birds are most closely related, then amphibians, and then sharks. Birds and mammals share more characteristics with each other than either does with amphibians. And then birds, mammals, and amphibians share more characteristics with each other than any of them share with sharks. That is precisely what we expect based on common ancestry. There is nothing anomalous regarding anatomy. There is nothing anomalous regarding molecules. There simply is nothing inconsistent, period. The kinds of inconsistencies he is describing would be something like if organisms that were found to be very closely related phylogenetically had wildly different genomes. Let's say that two species of frogs had so much genetic difference that they had completely and totally unrelated sets of enzymes. Now that would be pretty tough for evolution to explain. How could all of the enzymes operating in a biological system be so profoundly different between two species that must be so closely related anatomically? That's the sort of thing that would give creationism any kind of ammunition, so it's no surprise that it's completely and utterly non-existent anywhere in the biological world, because the tree of life is factually accurate. All the inconsistencies they refer to are either misrepresentations of basic biology or flat-out lies. Something that's happened uh, fairly recently is the discovery of what are called orphan genes. These are stretches of DNA that are found only in one group, not in any other group. Well, from the viewpoint of evolutionary theory, this isn't supposed to happen because all genes supposedly descended from genes in the past. These are the kinds of statements that allow us to know without a doubt that Wells is just dishonest. Nobody with a PhD in any area of biology would genuinely say something this stupid. Let's make something very clear. Nobody believes that all genes or all proteins share common ancestry. Genetic regions called promoters can be moved from one gene to another region of the genome that has no known function, and then that sequence can become transcribed by RNA polymerase into mRNA, which is then translated into an amino acid sequence. Brand new gene, brand new protein as the result of a single mutation event, something which has been observed countless times. Any undergraduate biology student knows this, and we talked about orphan genes, or de novo genes, in several of the videos in this series, because it's something that every single DI member chronically ignores. Second, orphan genes exist at all levels of taxonomy. Orphan genes can be found in a single species within a genus, or a single genus within a family, or a single family within an order, and so forth. That's why he says group instead of using actual taxonomic terminology. He's trying to make it sound like these genes are shared by only a particular species, and thus make it seem like they must be the product of a unique act of creation. But what is the logical conclusion of this line of thinking? Is the implication that every single species on Earth is the product of separate ancestry? Not even the other idiots at the DI propose this, like Meyer or Beckley. So why is Wells suggesting it? And yet, the more we study organisms, the more we find uh, orphan genes are just everywhere. They've been found in every organism whose whole genome has been studied so far. And they don't give you a tree of life, because they don't trace back to anything ancestral. Uh, so. Nowadays, when biologists try to construct a tree of life using molecules, they just toss out the orphan genes. They just ignore them. It's a process that's been referred to as cherry picking, where you pick certain data you want to keep and you throw out the rest. And that's what's going on here. 
Again, he is just blatantly lying. Nobody throws out anything or cherry picks anything. Orphan genes are specifically fantastic evidence of common ancestry. Why else would all the individuals in a species share an orphan gene unless they share a common ancestor? Why else would all the species in a genus share an orphan gene unless they share a common ancestor? Why else would all the genera in a family share an orphan gene unless they share a common ancestor? And so on. An orphan gene is the result of a singular mutation event, which can then be spread to offspring from that point forward. Unique genetic markers like orphan genes are immensely strong evidence for common ancestry, because the alternative is that all the members of a clade just so happen to share a diagnostic characteristic with no explanation. Just to show how big of a lie Wells is telling here, type orphan gene phylogeny into Google Scholar and get thousands of citations placing orphan genes into phylogenetic context. Just think about it. How can one even determine which genes are orphan genes if you don't place them in a phylogenetic context? You have to compare the genomes of different species if you want to know which genes they share and which ones they don't. This is well understood on the genetic level and the phylogenetic level. Wells just pretends it isn't because he wants to believe that all living organisms were uniquely created by his imaginary deity. So he has to poke holes in any science that make his belief system totally incompatible with reality. Now let's move on to the next video, Jonathan Wells, Human Evolution, Darwinism, Fossils, Science Uprising, Expert Interviews. Well, science can mean uh, testing hypotheses by comparing them with other evidence. It's a, it's a search for the truth. That's the science I love. But there's another kind of science that has become popular nowadays, and that's finding materialistic explanations for everything. That's materialistic science, not empirical science. For empirical science, the evidence matters the most. For materialistic science, the story matters the most. So Wells kicks this one off by regurgitating the same dumb script that every DI member spews. The product of countless roundtable sessions with the sole purpose of generating propaganda that will manipulate people into denying science. There is empirical science, and there is materialist science, you guys. Totally different. This is the most laughably idiotic narrative in their arsenal. They want the viewer to believe that scientists have an ideological agenda to disprove the existence of supernatural things, and that somehow they are doing science that is not empirical, as though finding rigorous physical explanations for things can be done any way other than empirically. Empiricism refers to knowledge that is gained through sense experience, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, or touching. Most of science is empirical. After all, how could science test a hypothesis concerning some phenomenon that can't be experienced with any of our senses? Examining geological strata, collecting fossils, determining their morphologies, their ages, sequencing genomes, and comparing their alignments. These are empirical processes. How is evolutionary biology anything but empirical? Wells would be totally unable to answer that question. He just relies on his viewers not knowing what evolution evolutionary biologists do or knowing what empiricism is. That's how he can scare them into equating science with evil materialism. In reality, there are plenty of religious scientists who don't subscribe to materialism, who believe in souls and deities, and simply accept that there is no scientific basis for such beliefs, since they are not based on science. The DI are not such people. They're frauds who deny science to serve a religious agenda. Empirical science is specifically what makes a materialistic worldview possible. Empirical science is what allowed us to figure out that the sun is the center of the solar system, that pathogens cause disease, and how life on Earth developed. So anyone who tries to put those two terms at odds with one another is clueless. When Darwin wrote his Origin of Species in 1859, he called it one long argument. And it was basically an argument against creation by design and in favor of a materialistic picture of evolution. Unguided natural processes explain everything. So that's the story. Darwin didn't have the evidence for that. He basically just had the argument. And ever since then, the evidence has been plugged into that story to serve as illustrations, when in fact the story comes first. 
More of the same bullshit. Wells needs to pretend that evolutionary biology is fundamentally at odds with spirituality. In actuality, evolution is not an argument for materialism. Evolution is a description of the various processes that give rise to biodiversity. One is free to believe that a god exists who is involved in that process, and many pro-science Christians around the world do. Elucidating the mechanisms behind natural phenomena is just how science works. Wells just has to pretend that science he doesn't like is somehow not real science. According to Darwin's theory, uh, a, a living thing is born from its parents, resembling the parents pretty much as human children resemble their parents. So if, in fact, the story of evolution is true, we would expect to see an innumerable number of transitional fossils uh, linking the old forms with the new. And we don't see that. We don't see that anywhere in the fossil record. Another one of their favorite lies. There are countless transitional fossils. We covered many of them earlier in the series when debunking Casey Luskin, Stephen Meyer, and Gunter Beckley. Creationists can whine about a lack of transitional fossils all they want, but the evidence from the fossil record is immaculately aligned with the predictions of evolutionary biology, and this alignment only gets stronger every year. That's why Wells just lies and moves on, hoping that viewers will just believe him and never check for themselves. When I look at an artistic depiction of Neanderthal, uh, I give it about as much uh, credit as I would something in the National Enquirer, uh, you know, a tabloid at the news, uh, newsstand. Uh, <clears throat> some people, experts, think that if I were to see a Neanderthal on a bus, I wouldn't be able to tell it from a modern human being. Others think it was more like the cavemen in the drawings that we see in National Geographic. The truth is, we don't know. Uh, it's all uh, very imaginative. Again, this is a lie. Our reconstructions are based on firm science. But much more importantly, who cares what a drawing looks like? The fact that Neanderthals and Denisovans form a sister clade to Homo sapiens isn't based on some artist's renderings. It's based on genomic data from all three species. The fact that birds nest within dinosauria is based on the morphological characters that birds and non-avian dinosaurs share in common, like a fourth trochanter, open acetabulum, and mesotarsal ankle joint. The fact that early whales like Pachycetus and Ambulocetus form a link between even-hoofed mammals and modern whales is based on their astragalus ankle bone that is diagnostic of even-hoofed mammals and an involucrum that is diagnostic of whales. The fact that Eusthenopteron, Pandorichthys, Tiktaalik, and Ichthyostega are related to all living tetrapods is based on them having a humerus, radius, and ulna, just like all living tetrapods. Wells is indistinguishable from a preacher when he does nothing but spew arguments from incredulity that ignore literally the entire body of science. It makes you wonder, what good is that PhD if all he does is preach? Probably the most famous uh, ape to human fossil uh, has been nicknamed Lucy. Uh, stood, I don't know, maybe three or four feet tall. Uh, the, as I understand it, the entire skeleton was not found. It's not, there's still some controversy over whether Lucy uh, walked on her feet or was knuckle dragging. Uh, but the main point for me as a biologist is I have seen no evidence whatsoever how a creature like that could transform into a human being. Chimps are chimps, gorillas are gorillas. There's no evidence for their transformation into anything like us. Another tactic straight from the creationist playbook, lie about Lucy. First, by calling it an ape-to-human specimen, he demonstrates that he doesn't even understand that humans are apes, so he just sounds like a complete moron. But the rest is just the typical script. Lie about the specimen and pretend it was one of a kind. We talked about this at great length in the Luskin debunk, and specifically about how we know for a fact that Lucy, the Australopithecus afarensis specimen, was facultatively bipedal. Her pelvis, knees, feet, and foramen magnum are conclusively indicative of bipedality over knuckle walking. 
And again, paleoanthropologists have hundreds of specimens of not just other afarensis individuals, but other species of Australopithecus. We know the genus as a whole was bipedal. There is nothing controversial here. Any anthropologist would laugh right in Wells' dumb face. And when he says he doesn't know how Lucy could have evolved into us, what the hell is he talking about? We have exactly the same bones in the same places in our bodies that Lucy does. The only difference is proportion. Our face is less prognathic, our brain case is larger, our pelvis is more bowl-shaped. Chimps are chimps! Yeah, and Lucy wasn't a chimp. The plethora of intermediate species that link humans to the common ancestor of humans and other extant apes display a slow gradient of characteristics to get to humans. You have to be a moron not to see it. Every uh, year or two, uh, we see some headline about the latest fossil find of the missing link between apes and humans. And uh, the track record is not good for these things. They, they sort of fall by the wayside soon after the, the hype is over. Uh, most recently, a bunch of bones were found in a cave in South Africa and hyped as our ancestors. Uh, most experts now don't believe that, but the hype was there. And uh, we'll get a hype again next year for some other fossil find. And it's all just uh, a story in need of evidence. Yes, John, the entire field of anthropology is hype. It's not just science you never learned and lie about. First, yes, it's dumb that popular media would portray any fossil as a missing link, since this doesn't really mean anything. It's not a scientific term. And yes, the popular media loves to sensationalize finds because that's how they make their money. If you want to actually learn about science, you should read the primary literature, which doesn't sensationalize the data. But to get more specific, Wells is referring to the Homo naledi finds in South Africa that do have an odd mix of primitive and derived traits. While they aren't considered our direct ancestors, this doesn't say anything about Homo erectus, which has been considered to be ancestral to Homo sapiens for decades. Why didn't Wells say anything about Homo erectus, or any of the other hominid species we know so much about and are definitely ancestral to our species? Just pretend it's all based on a few bones in a cave and brush off an entire field of science. That's creationism for you. Not too long ago, a fossil was found that uh, was thought to uh, predate, uh, I think, Lucy. Uh, and the expectation was that it would look sort of chimpanzee-like. Well, it turned out not to look chimpanzee-like at all. And so uh, the initial hype uh, put it out there as, you know, the ancestor of us all. But when the actual evidence came in and was analyzed carefully, it turned out not to be true. So there's a strong bias here to put the fossils in pre-existing slots in the story as though they looked like they belong there, when in fact it often turns out that they don't. It's impossible to tell what Wells is referring to here, as he's just completely talking out of his ass. The Lucy specimen is 3.2 million years old, and Australopiths have been found as far back as 4.5 million years ago, while the first Homo specimens don't appear until 2.5 million years ago. Let's be charitable and assume he means that a more derived species of Australopithecus was found predating Lucy, which also is fine. Indeed, Australopithecus garhi is more derived than afarensis, and some garhi specimens predate Lucy. Evolution isn't a linear process, it branches. The fact that an older species overlaps in time with some later species is no more an argument against evolution than the fact that your grandparents or parents overlap in time with you. Wells is relying on a basic misunderstanding of evolution to push his lies. And it gets a little tiresome hearing him repeat this idiotic lie that an entire field of science is just a story when he is literally just telling false stories without actually referencing any scientific literature. A serious critique of science refers to actual science. He's just sitting in a chair and lying to the camera. It's profoundly transparent. Anyway, let's move on to one last video. Jonathan Wells, author of Zombie Science, Fossil Finds Only Confuse Human Origins. When I published Icons of Evolution in 2000, uh, what I called the ultimate icon 
was a drawing of an ape-like creature gradually morphing through more and more human-like animals into a modern human being. Uh, this is perhaps the most powerful icon of all. Uh, it touches us most directly uh, in the sense that it's about our own origin. And it's basically uh, an imaginative drawing to illustrate a materialistic story, namely that we morphed into our modern form through unguided evolution uh, without any design. Funny how a guy with credentials in cell biology never shuts up about anthropology, huh? Anyway, this time he's acting like he's the one who figured out the march of progress isn't a precisely accurate representation of evolutionary biology, which is pathetic. The picture was in a book published in 1965 and was illustrated by artist Rudolf Zallinger. The picture demonstrates a direct line of descent from one species to another, but we've known for a long time that this isn't how evolution actually works. This idea is more in line with orthogenesis, a now defunct idea of evolution that visualizes the process as goal-oriented. In reality, evolution is blind. Natural selection has no goal and only acts on stochastic variations. In short, this is just a drawing. He pretends a drawing represents the totality of scientific knowledge because his viewers have zero knowledge and will believe him. Probably the funniest example of these new fossil discoveries is Ida, which was reported in 2009, accompanied by a lot of hype, as they usually are. It was called the eighth wonder of the world, uh, among other things, uh, a two-hour documentary was produced before the announcement in the scientific literature, uh, so the hype was, was guaranteed to hit big time. Uh, within a year, the thing had been discredited. It turned out to be a lemur, not an ancestor of modern primates, modern human beings. More lies. Ida is a specimen of Darwinius macilli from the Messel Pit in Germany, dating to 47 million years ago. While she was hyped up by the media, which is irrelevant, she is definitely not just a lemur. Originally, Ida was thought to be a primitive member of Haplorini, the clade encompassing tarsiers, new and old world monkeys, and apes. But she was then moved to the next closest branch, Strepsirini. Evolution predicts that lineages become more similar to each other the further you go back in time, and this is no exception. So it's not surprising in the slightest that the researchers thought Ida was a primitive member of one clade when she was then found to be a primitive member of the sister clade. Ida is a primitive strepsirene, the clade encompassing lemurs, lorises, and bush babies, or galagos. Ida herself is primitive with respect to all these animals, so she is no more just a lemur than she is just a bush baby. Ida is transitional between extant strepsirenes and earlier primates. Wells is just lying as usual. The other fossils that have been reported in the intervening years are perhaps not so hyped up uh, and not so discredited, but in any case, they, it seems that every discovery uh, complicates the story of human evolution more, as in fact evolutionary biologists predicted in the 1980s. Uh, so instead of ending up with a nice clean line from an ape-like creature, chimpanzee-like creature, whatever, to a modern human being, uh, each discovery complicates matters even more than they were complicated before. So we still don't know uh, really what human evolution looked like if, in fact, it was evolution at all. You're probably seeing a trend by now. Every video with Wells is just him ignoring the entire body of scientific knowledge and saying, nuh-uh. He just says new discoveries make things worse when they obviously don't. Thousands of specimens collected over a century have outlined evolutionary pathways that perfectly explain all the primates we see today. Of course, he will never provide any citations, and he will never read from actual primary scientific literature because his audience doesn't need or want to see that. They want to be told a story. 
That's what Wells is here to do. Tell a story of the corrupt materialist scientists. This requires ignoring literally all scientific data, but also misrepresenting basic biological concepts. Wells unabashedly promotes the idea that evolution should be represented by a straight line and not a branching tree, despite constantly referencing the tree of life. His stupidity even contradicts his own stupidity. The, uh discovery of mis missing links is uh, really quite funny. Uh, the fact is, uh, there, there's no way to link fossils together in a chain of ancestry and descent. False. Many foraminifera, diatoms, and radiolarians do exhibit ancestor-descendant relationships. Some vertebrates in the fossil record do too. One good example is Myotragus balearicus. This is a species of goat that lived solely on the Balearic Islands. Because it lived in just one place, we can be well assured that the later Myotragus are descended from the earlier Myotragus. Another example would be North American chasmosaurians, which show gradual morphological change over millions of years. Sometimes it's more complicated than this, sometimes it isn't. But as usual, Wells just says, nuh-uh, and walks away. So the term missing link is, is very misleading. The reason you can't do that is, uh, well, just imagine finding out in a field uh, two human skeletons buried in the ground. Unless you have identifying marks or written records, or maybe in some cases some DNA, you can't tell whether they're related to each other. So when you dig up two fossils on two different continents that are millions of years apart and thousands of miles apart and not even the same species, how do you know whether one is related to the other? You can't. And actually, evolutionary biologists have pointed this out. You cannot link fossils. The fossils themselves do not provide the evidence for ancestry and descent. This is a profoundly stupid argument. He is saying we can't know if two human skeletons are related to each other. But first of all, how related? All humans are related. Even young Earth creationists believe this. We can't know if they are immediately related. So what? We know they are of the same species. Unless Wells is willing to defend the idea that a single species may result from multiple separate creation events, this is a totally moot argument. If he is pretending that humans don't all share common ancestry, again, he's at odds with even young Earth creationists. How would we be able to tell what amount of DNA differences are sufficient to separate populations of humans into distinct creations? The fact is that this argument is arbitrary and nonsensical. Not only is there no amount of DNA that defines separate populations of humans as being distinctly created, there is no amount of DNA that defines separate species as being distinctly created, or separate genera, or families, or orders, and so on. These are labels that we provide. Support for evolution comes from the morphology of fossils, their age, their location within strata, and all sorts of other data that Wells doesn't even mention. He is operating from a level of biological understanding that is typical of a science illiterate preacher, because in the end, that is the part he is trying to play. He is selling the idea that speciation doesn't happen. Everything on Earth was created precisely as it is, something that is even more idiotic than what most of his D.I. cronies spew. But at any rate, we can stop here, combing through more videos to hear him repeat these lies ad nauseum, as well as the same idiotic lies that are told by Meyer and Luskin and every other one of these frauds would just be overkill. They all say the same exact things. They either ignore or distort all the relevant science. Much of what we went over here is just a repeat of previous debunks because these people don't have unique talking points. Wells is just another garden variety apologist slinging lies for cash, and his academic laurels are nothing more than a stain on those institutions. When the DI pretends that their preachers are scientific because they don't bring up God, it's a smokescreen. People like Wells publicly admit that they only entered science to disprove it as a religious crusade. The agenda is blatantly obvious even when not referenced, and it's not a surprise to anyone who has watched any installment of this series. 
So that's it for Jonathan Wells, another Discovery Institute clown fading into ever greater irrelevance, his holy crusade having ended up a complete and utter failure. Believe it or not, we still have a few more of these bozos to get through, so I'll see you next time.